Hey guys, don't forget to like and subscribe for more content and leave a comment below of which former player or icon of the game you would like to see on the fat side. You've got McAvaney, Cometti and Roberts. And then you've got these two. Nuffies. Living in denial. It's Croft and Horto. Welcome to the Fat Side Podcast. Okay, so this is our, what is it, Rob? Our fifth episode of the Fat Side. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Fifth episode. And we're lucky, lucky enough to have Mr. Glenn Manton with us. Uh, before we give you a more professional introduction, Glenn, what's going on, mate? Are you in your car? I am out in the garage in the car, hiding from three teenagers, just trying to find a little cocoon of silence <laughs> in which we can have a conversation. So I'm sitting in the passenger seat because there's always going to be some lame person watching saying, is he driving? Is he driving his car right now? No, I'm not. I'm sitting in the passenger seat in my garage of a little 1972 BMW 2002 called Heidi. So Heidi and I have a lovely little relationship. I love this little car. And uh, she will be our cocoon of conversation, if you like, for the next 30 minutes. Okay then, Glenn. I like it. Now, the more formal introduction, because this is a footy podcast, is the fact that you played 178 games, 21 with Essendon, 157 with Carlton. And of course, you were a premiership player in 1995 with the Mighty Blues. Um, That's formal. Yeah. Yes, it was very formal indeed. Let me just adjust the tie. <laughs> no ties here, trust me. Not on this podcast. Um, now, Glenn, for the listeners that aren't aware and, and the viewers, uh, what have you been doing post-footy? I, I know a little bit about you. I know you're very big on the motivational speaking circuit and you do a lot of work with disadvantaged youth and just the youth in general, a big advocate in that space. So just give the people a little bit of an indication of what you're up to at the moment. I've been preparing for the apocalypse, so that's why I'm out here in my car, just ready to roll if it all goes pear-shaped, which I'm looking out at the sun today and the birds singing, which would indicate that we've probably got at least another two or three days left of happiness before it all comes crashing down. And there's no more toilet paper or frozen bananas or any other things that I find essential on a daily basis. But what have I been doing since my AFL career? I've been speaking publicly. That's what I do day in, day out. Although this unfortunate COVID-19 pandemic has seen my business completely obliterated with all bookings in the near future put on hold because I like to work face-to-face -face with people, share stories about my life. You mentioned the word inspirational, or motivational. I'm not inspirational or motivational. I'm far from it. I don't believe in that. I think if any guest speaker or any speaker in general thinks that they're motivational or inspirational, you should not deal with them at all because inspiration and motivation come from the person themselves, not from some idiot standing up and talking uh, for five minutes or an hour. It comes from within the group. Uh, so what I like to do is run big guided conversations with people and uh, most people wouldn't probably know that I have two degrees, both of them back into education. So I do a lot of consultancy back to education work with young people. You mentioned my charity uh, in an offhand way there, White Lion, White Lion's still up and running some, goodness me, what are we, 20 odd years, maybe 21 years after it was founded in uh, 1999. My maths isn't great. Uh, so working with young people in juvenile justice, uh, dysfunctional young people, young people who have been heavily uh, influenced by poor background, drug abuse, et cetera, et cetera, and trying to work for them and help them uh, find ways in which they can improve their life. So doing that sort of stuff, obviously raising a family, have three teenagers, although I should uh, retract that comment because my eldest son just turned 20. So now officially an adult, I guess. Uh, although some of his actions would uh, suggest otherwise. <laughs> uh, I have a dog, a little uh, Maltese Shih Tzu called Jax, who I am unbelievably in love with. I think he's the greatest human on earth. Uh, he is, of course, there is a human inside that little dog outfit. Uh, I love that dog. And I, I love cars. I love my music, uh, all these sorts of things. I love to write. I, I wrote a new book last year called Put Your Damn Phone Down, which was a bestseller across this country. Uh, so, again, my writing, my music, my want to connect with people and share with people is what I've been doing pre, during, and now post-football. So, really, nothing much has changed. 
You've uh, got some pretty good media credentials in your time through your playing career and obviously past that, footy show, Vega, Fox, Triple R, The Age. Um, you touched on it there, your, your new your new book, Put Your Damn Phone Down. Um, if you could give a little elevator pitch because there's a lot of people out there who have got some time to mm. read a book and they're probably looking at their phones a lot. Uh, quickly, what, what's it about? Well, it's no longer. So I won't pitch that book. I'll pitch the revamp or the relaunch, if you like, which is called Real Me, Real You. Uh, it's a series of stories from my life, uh, really gritty, hard-hitting, provocative stories, things that people wouldn't pick in terms of my life, my upbringing, what I've been through, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and interspersed with those particular stories, which have been written in a condensed form. I don't think anyone, particularly youth-based, wants to sit down and read 20,000 words at a time at this particular juncture of, of the life cycle that we're all living. So I've tried to write these bite-sized, hard-hitting pieces, somewhere between 12 and probably 1,800 words a pop. And as I was saying, interspersed with those particular pieces, which run from my mentoring background through to work I've done with heroin addicts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there are 50 provocative questions. Of course, that means 50 if you do it five times. Uh, and those questions range from the flippant, so who was your first crush, through to really confronting questions such as, do we all choose how we die? And it has little adjuncts to those questions for you to go out and research and put in your own time and effort into developing an understanding of those questions. Because I think those sorts of questions are the questions that you, me, everyone needs to be able to answer on a daily basis. And if I can get up on a soapbox just for one second, I feel like we're in a big puddle of shit as a community, as a, as a world at the moment. And a lot of that is because many people choose to be oblivious to the issues that are around them. And then all of a sudden, idiots in brackets, Donald Trump, et cetera, et cetera, find themselves elected into government. We all scratch our heads asking why. Well, if we were better prepared at the back end and took more interest in our lives, the lives of others and caring and working for a better community, we wouldn't find ourselves in this puddle of shit. Well said, Glenn. I've had a lot of interesting conversations with my wife on the couch in the last three weeks in isolation, and it's been an incredible time to reflect. Uh, I keep hearing the word recalibrate. Um, but for those people that unfortunately, like yourself, who have lost their, their livelihood um, and their work, what can you say to people to try and remain upbeat and positive during such a difficult time because reflection and reevaluating is a great thing. But for those people that have been hit the hardest, how can they pull themselves out of the mire, so to speak, in your opinion? Look, I, I, I think for me, I, I have so much influence in my life from music and for that matter, literature, but it, music in particular, I think about, you know, Madonna, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, whoever it may be, there's, you know, I guess a, uh, an interesting uh, comparison there between two artists. How do they survive over such long periods of time? How are they continually successful? Well, love them or hate them. Madonna in particular seems to have a lot of hatred from people in the community. I admire her at least as an artist in the sense of what's coming next? How can I change? How can I reinvent? How can I find a way forward? doesn't mean that we might necessarily like what she's produced lately or for that matter the red hot chili peppers or anyone in between but they're trying to think about what is coming next and i personally have spent the last oof, whatever it's been two weeks two and a half weeks uh, maybe more it feels like forever uh trying to think about what's next what's next for me how can i do what i do better differently do i have to go and dig a ditch for a, a month at some point in time in order just to have work, to have some meaning in my life. For me, it's not a case of any monetary gain or financial stability. It's about my own emotional and psychological stability. What is my purpose? What am, what am I doing here with my life? And I'm not afraid to say to any of your listeners and or viewers here at this point in time, I don't know what's next for me personally. I don't know what I'm going to do. For example, and I think it is worth discussing, even though we're, we're down a bit of a rabbit hole, a lot of people keep saying to me, hey, you should do a whole host of video stuff. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. That, that could be something worth approaching and getting my head around and finding a way in which I can do that. But I think moving forward, there's going to be a great need for me to be able to provide that reconnection and reintegration of people. 
And I think to myself, how can I be ready for that? What can I be doing differently to ensure that I'm not just a, a, a standing behind a lectern, this speaking head talking at an audience? Because I don't think that's what's going to be required in the past, present and or future, even more so in the future. So people listening, watching, I think the key to this time is thinking, pushing finding ways in which you can engage with something beyond what you already knew and look for another way forward. And that could be a simple, one of the things that I've loved during this time is seeing so many dads in the park with their kids. Yeah. You just don't get to see that. So if Mr. Johnson can all of a sudden say, you know what, on a Wednesday moving forward, I'm working from home and at 3.30 or whatever it may be, I'm going to pick up my kids from school and take them to the park and spend time with them, well, then that's a win for Mr. Johnson. So it doesn't have to be some sort of huge financial gain or dramatic career turn. I mean, I'm not going to come out, out in the cone-shaped bras. That's not going to happen. I would look good in it, no doubt, in the cone-shaped bras, but Madonna's done that. We'll let her run with that. I've got to try and find a way forward for me personally, my family, the community that's productive and is a new way of thinking. The thing that scares me, Adrian and Rob, out of this time, is will we come out of all of this still doing the same inane shit that we did that led us to get into this particular mess that we're in? There are so many ways in which we can better our lives in the community. Have we got the courage to push back against the boys club and the bullshit? Uh, even just this morning, I was watching a little bit of a, a thing on YouTube, a thing on YouTube about billionaires. Like seriously, who the fuck needs to be a billionaire? Who needs to be a billionaire? What the fuck do you do with that money? Honestly, honestly, that is embarrassing. If you're a billionaire, you should be embarrassed. You should be genuinely embarrassed. Unless, of course, you're pulling it all in to dish it all out. Because, my God, that's just a really big blight on our community that anyone even wants to be a billionaire. Just focus on being a damn good person. How about that? Yes, a very good lesson there, Glenn. And uh, you're scratching me right where I itch, and we could go on for hours. But what we're going to do is groin. We, uh, definitely not my groin, uh, my hairless back. Uh, but what we're going to do, Glenn, is we're going to have a bit of a an escapism, so to speak. We're going to take a trip down memory lane with with footy. Uh, of course, the lockout season. There are a lot of people that are. Uh, I guess downtrodden um, and feeling a bit flat about it all, not having uh, footy in their lives. It's created quite a big void. And you talk about that connection with um, a little boy and his father. Well, for me, footy was exactly that. It was going down to the MCG and doing the, the seven-hour round trip from uh, Yarrawonga and going to watch our beloved Melbourne Football Club. And it's probably my favourite thing to do with my father. So it's a great little segue, Glenn. And I think the first point of call is um, let's just go right back to the start. Where did you start your junior footy career? I started playing footy in the streets of Ascot Vale. So out the front of number one Kelvin Street was my grandmother's house. That's where I played my football as a kid. There were a set of goals between fences and trees on that street. The ground itself would have been, I don't know, 35 metres long. And it was me and my dad versus two of the local kids. Uh, we played this two-on-two -two game of football. My dad seemed like some sort of superhero out on that particular space, dodging parked cars and moving cars for that matter and kicking these horrendous drop kicks off the ground for goals. There were all sorts of rules about how you could play in that confined space. And that really shaped my football career. And I agree with you, that time spent with dad and or mum in these sorts of sporting environments is worth its weight in gold. So I'd play football all day Saturday, all day Sunday on the streets of uh, Ascot Vale. I absolutely loved that time. Uh, in particular, I loved three-quarter time when my grandmother would come out with a lemonade concoction. I say concoction because I do think it had some sort of spirit in there. I think <laughs> I was a very young alcoholic. I'd be drinking this drink at three-quarter time, and I tell you what, I'd come out and I'd kill it in the fourth quarter. I don't know what <laughs> Grand put in that drink, but it had me absolutely flying. I'd be flying all over the field. But from there, I played a little bit of junior football, in the Essendon District Football League and ended up going to Essendon as a 16-year-old to work through their junior programs ahead of the under-19s reserves and then senior football. So I had a fairly traditional football 
uh, journey, if you will, at that time, because that's what you did. You played through those combined teams. You went into a little feeder system. You went through an under-19s competition. You spent what seemed like 10 years in the reserves. And for me, it probably was about 10 years in the reserves, running around kicking you off the ground before senior games. And then, of course, you get your big break to play senior football, which I did against Melbourne at the MCG, where I played on Gary Lyon in my very first game. Smashed him, too. You smashed him too. Well, you, you've uh, you've led straight into my my next question, which was going to be that first game. Uh, Gary Lyon, pretty big task for an eighteen year old debuting. How'd you feel? Uh, I was beside myself because Kevin Sheedy just put me through this ringer of bullshit leading into the game. Are you in the team? Are you out of the team? What the hell is your purpose at this club? I had no idea. I was just trying to answer these questions in my mind. And it wasn't until the day of the game at about 10.30 a.m. that he rang me to say that I'm I'm in the team. So it's, yeah, so it's literally an hour before you'd have to leave because back in those days, it would take a good hour to get into the MC during bite way through, you know, the traffic and the people and the space in order to get into the rooms and play. And so it wasn't until the morning of the game that I knew I was going to be playing on this particular player who, of course, is a, a wonderful player uh, of AFL football. And at that time, you know, pretty much in his prime, if you will. And, uh, you know, what, what can you do? I think maybe the, the hype and the stress of it all just allowed me to run out there and just play football and not stress about it too much. But I ran out, uh, you know, a complete phony. I had my jumper tucked in, my socks pulled up, you know, my hair looking all neat and tidy. I was just, I was just trying to fit into the, the I guess the the round peg hole, uh, and of course I was square, so it, it just wasn't working. So that whole period at Essendon was a time where I, I just I couldn't feel comfortable, I couldn't be myself, and I really didn't respect the way I was treated by the senior people there. You know, in particular Kevin Sheedy, I just thought, you know, this is just ordinary behaviour, and in fact, his treatment of me as a young person has allowed me to work with young people in a particular way moving forward, uh, which I think has, I guess, turned a negative into a positive. Glenn, I just want to pick you up on something that uh, I, I believe it was a podcast that you did maybe a couple of years ago. I think it was with Croc Media and there was a particular quote that I saw about you and how you had this incident where you'd basically torn your arm to shreds, uh, to put it, Lightly, there was an incident on Sydney Road um, that could have potentially taken your your footy career career away from you. Um, are you able to explain exactly what happened and what that meant for you at the time? Because there was something in that quote, and um, this is just off the top of my head. Remember reading it, where you said that you didn't feel like you were the the version of yourself that you wanted to be. You were Glenn Manton, the footballer. You weren't actually the Glenn Manton. Um, that you strive to be. So what does that exactly mean? And, and what was the incident? Long-winded answer, but hopefully you can speed it up to some degree. <laughs> and that people will get freaked out in the edit on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in, grade, in grade two, quite sincerely, Miss Timbery, Strathmore Primary, wrote down in my report card, Glenn is a highly creative, imaginative thinker. And to this day, that's one of the nicest things that anyone's ever said about me, particularly at such a young age, because I think that is the heart of growth. That is the heart of being a true human being, that you have uh, an engagement with your own mind and the world around you that promotes different uh, thinking, abilities, drivers, conversations, whatever it may be. And, and I held on to that throughout my whole childhood. But it wasn't until I hit that football space that all of a sudden I was confronted by the fact that I genuinely was different to all these other people that I was surrounded with. I, I retract that statement to many of the other people that I was surrounded by. And certainly the system. I was very different to the system itself. And it took me a long time to understand just how different I was. And as I was going through that space, I just started feeling more and more uncomfortable about myself and thinking, well, wow, I, I just can't portray who I really am here because if I show them who I really am, they're not going to like who I am and I'm not going to be able to play sport. So, you know, there was no way I was going to talk about arts in that space. There was no way I was going to talk about the books that I was reading or the places that I wanted to visit, et cetera, et cetera, because everything just seemed to be so blokey, so... Uh, blinkered so narrow and uh, so very much, as I said earlier in, the, in this little pod slash video, uh, boys club orientated that I just thought I had to find a way to 
play this game. And so I went from being Glenn Manton, who was, you know, very free and, and uh, I guess, interested in everything to being narrow minded and focused in what I thought was an effort to be a footballer. And I started to do things that were well out of my character and, and not part of my true ethos as a person. And one particular night, I found myself in a huge brawl that spilled out onto the streets of Sydney Road in Coburg. And because of the sheer ferocity of the fight and the number of people who were in the fight, I became disoriented. And when I swung my arm to continue to grapple and carry on in, in a way in which I thought it probably a footballer would late at night, big hero, big man, uh, full of alcohol, uh, embarrassingly so. Uh, I swung my arm and I didn't realize my back was flush against a shop front window. My right elbow penetrated the window, smashed a hole through that window. Very spectacular, something out of the matrix. And unfortunately, when I pulled my arm back out to continue to fight, a huge shard of glass got caught on my right elbow and cut my arm in half. So I was rushed off to hospital. To this day, I'm not sure who called the ambulances. There were no mobile phones back then. And in the essentially the emergency department of the Royal Melbourne Hospital with the curtain drawn around me, my arm up in a brace, bleeding, stemmed. A doctor stood before me. The doctor would be seconded from the UK, never heard of Glenn Manson, knew nothing about AFL football, never met me before, quite obviously. And whilst the nurse was taking my vital signs, he stood at the foot of my bed. He said to me, you're a fake, you're a phony, you're a fraud. He said to me, you're a right joke. And he told me that he was going to perform surgery on every other person in the hospital there that night, that I would be the last person he'd perform surgery on. And he told me that I had to think about what sort of human being I wish to be. He then walked to the door. He opened the door from this particular little space, had the curtain drawn around me. The curtain's being drawn back by the nurse. He's just opened the door about 10 inches. Nurse has stopped drawing the curtain. And he said to me, do you see this doorknob? And I've nodded my head. And he said, I just let you know that you never turn the knob of a door again. You see how that English accent comes in and out badly both ways. And I just nodded my head and uh, was very vulnerable at that time. And he just said, it's going to take hours to put your arm together, but you need to get your head together because I think you're a right joke. And so that night in that hospital at that time, I made a decision that I had to be more authentic back to my core values and particularly in terms of a football context I still wrestled with it a lot over the course of my time at Essendon I just couldn't really find my feet as my true person I love the way in which uh, the players at Essendon would treat me I don't feel like it was a playing group thing I still have so many wonderful friends from that Essendon space guys who I really really value I'm, I feel like they're my older brothers and they probably treated me as such but it was more that coaching space and in particular Kevin Sheedy you know he really didn't invest any time in understanding who I was as a person or what made me tick or function he didn't realize that it, you know I was probably the most focused and dedicated person at that football club if not in general if not just in daily life I mean that's just who I am I'm very pragmatic I'm very thoughtful, I'm very disciplined, and I'm very structured. But most people just see, I guess, the differences that you see outwardly and become very panicked at that, particularly in that controlling football oppressive atmosphere. So uh, it, was a, it was a very challenging time for me. And, of course, on my right elbow here, which now is hidden by a peony flower, but there's a huge scar that wraps its way right back through into my tricep where I cut my arm in half. And if you look at my hand, and I'm not sure if we can pick that up on film, but all this muscle through my hand is all eroded. There's no muscle there. It's never coming back. It's gone. I can't close my hand properly anymore. Probably need to get some sticky tape for that. Uh, I can't feel part of my arm properly anymore because all the damage to the nerves in my arm. So, I mean, this was something that confronted me as a 17, 18 year old boy and I had to readjust my life and I could talk about it for hours, quite honestly. Most people probably heard enough now, but that was the catalyst for me to truly become the person that I am. It's crazy to think you talk about all the damage you've done there with your nerves that you could then actually go back and play any level of football, whether it be the top grade or anything down to come back from that. You did get back, you played reserves for a while and you sort of flirted with some time at the team. Eventually though, end of 1994, you did get delisted by the club um, can you share with us your experience of what it's like to be told that, you know, you're getting delisted? 
Well, the truth is, Robin, and maybe some people don't know this, maybe you don't know this, but I actually got back that next year after cutting my arm in half and played in the under-19s. I was made captain. I worked through that entire year. I was runner-up in the Morrish medal, and then I was delisted. I was brought into Kevin Sheedy's office. I thought he was going to say to me, hey, terrific job. You've got your head in gear. You've got your football in gear. We can see a future for you. Uh, but he didn't. The only future he saw was me leaving out the door and not going back. So I was delisted there once. He then redrafted me, which was the equivalent of dropping your girlfriend on the Friday and picking her up again on the Monday. Yeah. So that doesn't work too well. So that really destroyed our relationship right there and then. And then, of course, in 1994... Uh, I thought I'd had a great year. I'd improved. I'd got better as a player. Uh, I certainly thought I was on the way up. But again, as we moved into 95, because there was a pre-season draft, he delists me again. So I'm delisted twice. And for me, uh, they were gut punches, no doubt, particularly because maybe because of my stupidity, my naivety, I didn't see either of them really coming. Uh, probably should have known better. But... I was never at any stage going to drop my bundle. That's why here, again, you know, if we can go full circle, if you like, in this COVID-19 phase that we're all in, I feel vulnerable. I feel stressed. I'm not happy where, where things are for me individually or the community as a whole slash the globe. But I'm not going to drop my bundle. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to throw in the towel, any of those analogies that you like to ring up. I'm not going to do any of those things I'm going to find a way forward and that's exactly how I felt when I was delisted I had no understanding or no idea that that way forward would be to go to the Carlton Football Club in 1995 and then become part of one of the all-time great teams I think yeah I, I certainly agree with that I think the 95 Carlton team is one of my it's one of my favorites um it's one that uh, often gets spoken about by my father uh, who understands his footy inside out and um, it's certainly one that the Carlton fans cherish as well because um, it's been a long time between drinks for them. Um, when you get to Carlton, um, it takes a while, Glenn. It takes a while to actually break in to the team. I think it's round 12 that you make your debut for them. I think you only get dropped once on the lead into the finals. You played 12 of 13 games and, of course, you play in the grand final, the successful grand final against Geelong. Um, was it even sweeter for you given the fact that you're in the stands in 93 for the Essendon uh, grand final against Carlton uh, watching on which must have been bloody hard Um, and then all of a sudden you get this chance with Carlton Um, it takes half a year to break into the team you stay in the team and then you taste the ultimate success at the end of the 95 season Um, all of those things and you boil them down um, into one incredible journey for you in such a short space of time. Um, did it make it just even more euphoric for you knowing all the hurdles you had to overcome? Hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? I mean, we're sitting here in 2020 being able to look back on this particular period of time, 25 years ago. Uh, at the time, I think virtually every day my head was spinning because you're not entirely sure about where things were at and what was going to unfold but I can certainly join the dots now and put it all together. And that probably starts back in 1993 where missing out on playing in that grand final was one of the greatest, uh, what would you call it, gifts, uh, underline that five times, gifts uh, in my life. Because at that game, the 93 grand final, I met a mentor, Alec Eppes, who is somebody that I just, I couldn't have more love for respect, care, time for. So Alex steps into my life in 93, delisted into the uh, pre-season of 95, went to Carlton, which I'd never imagined playing for, turn up for training. I don't even have a pair of boots because Essendon wouldn't let me take my boots. I kept them in a little cage there, like some sort of panda at the Essendon Football Club. So I had my, my caged boots. I couldn't even take boots. I remember Parco saying to me, well, put your boots on. I said, Parco, I don't even have any boots. And he said, well, here's a T-shirt at least. And they threw me the CUB T-shirt, which I, I still have. They're the sorts of memorabilia pieces that I like. So I've still got that CUB T-shirt. It's actually just over here in the garage. Uh, I can probably smell it from here. Uh, and uh, then worked my way through the pre-season. There was one game in the pre-season where uh, I was involved in a contest and I ended up on all fours and I crawled after the ball 
uh, probably four or five metres. I crawled a long way that shows you the standard of the game in terms of uh, how slow it was and the, the ground that we were playing on. Uh, it was just a different game back then. Like, you can't imagine a player being able to crawl four or five metres and actually get to the ball in 2019, 2021. It's just not going to happen. The ball's just gone like that. But I remember crawling after the ball and diving on the ball again, another thing that you just couldn't do in modern play. And after the game, Parco pulled me aside and he said, I saw you crawl after the ball and then dive on top of the ball. And I said, oh, you know, yes. And he said, I just wanted to know, I wanted to tell you, I should say, I wanted you to know that as soon as I saw that, I knew we'd made a really great decision in drafting you. And from there, I knew that I was going to be part of the team at some point. And that point was to be about round nine. Uh, but I strained my hamstring. I don't, don't know why I managed to strain my hamstring at that time. It was a ridiculously uh, poor choice of timing for my hamstring to put its hand up and say, hey, I'm a bit sore. But I missed out on playing on the game that I thought I was going to play in. And then obviously I got back into the team. I think it was against Richmond, maybe at, uh, at Optus Oval, Princess Park, Icon Park, whichever grounds you'd like to name it or remember it as. And as you say, uh, Adrian, from there... I, I hung on to my chance to play and I was I was lucky enough to know that I was going to be in the grand final side and uh, I became a Swiss Army knife for the team, which was really, really handy because it saw me be able to do all sorts of roles, which I greatly enjoyed. Yeah, you were the quintessential spoiling defender. Uh, you would certainly uh, give a lot of forwards and some of the best forwards in the game a really torrid time. Um Just randomly as a little side note before I bring up the 1990 prelim final, which I'm sure Rob is going to love as an Essendon fan. Um, uh, There's a random game in in, in the time that you get into the team from round 12 onwards. Now, I don't want to I don't want to throw you under the bus too much, Glenn, because of course possessions wasn't everything for you, but you were averaging about I think it was six and a half touches per game over that 12, 13 game period before the 95. Uh, grand final but there's one random game where you get 20 touches against the Lions what happened that day can you remember what role you were doing and where you were playing because it it stuffed the averages up Glenn (laughs) look you identified the key word there and that is role the reason the 95 team was so good both on and off field is everybody knew their role we had a fitness coordinator who would run through his standard and programmed fitness routines basically with every session, we knew what was coming. We had Parco sharing his, uh, I guess, again, drills, uh, inputs, if you will. We knew what was coming. Each and every game, we knew what our roles were as a team and we played them accordingly. And that's really the story of my entire career, Uh, with the exception of probably maybe 96, 97, where I got a chance to actually play my football in my position, my way. The rest of my career... I had to play my role. I had to do what I was told to do. Otherwise, I I didn't really get a game. So it wasn't a choice of me going out on the field and saying, right, I'm going to get 25 possessions today because I could easily get 25 possessions. I could get 40 possessions. Anyone could do that if they're given the scope to do that. I mean, I can't I can't think of almost one time in my career when I ran behind the mark and took a cheap handball and then just kicked it to oblivion. You know, I'd get the ball myself and kick it to oblivion. But (laughs) <laughs> the facts are getting possessions isn't what the game is about. It's about playing your role and playing it effectively and then being rewarded as such. There's nothing worse than going out there in whatever field or let alone even in your family, you do the right thing and no one acknowledges it. If you get that acknowledgement, that that credibility for doing the right thing, then you're happy to continue to do it. So against the Brisbane Lions, that might have been a case of one of the more senior players. And my goodness, we had so many great senior players in that team. Maybe one of those players had to step aside or step out of the space and I got a chance to actually play uh, more minutes, a more significant role, and maybe got a little bit lucky on the day where the ball does chase you a little bit or you do find yourself getting a couple of easier possessions. But certainly I think every good football supporter has to be aware of the players in their team who play their roles and, and play them well. And I think that's for the players who get a lot of possessions and the players who get few possessions. There's nothing worse. And again, history will be littered forever in every sport of those people who are stat stuffers, but literally at the end of the day, didn't do anything to influence the team or the game. Now, Rob, just quickly, I should have remembered, of course, that that was the Bears uh, or the Fitzroy Lions in 95, because we are actually doing a, 
a series on the merger between Melbourne and Hawthorne. So for anyone, any of the uh, the sticky beaks out there, the Danny Nimonis of this world, who knows his footy like no one else I've ever seen before, Croft, I need to just clarify that. Yes, you do. Uh, before Adrian brings up a game that I'd rather not remember. Oh, why don't you want uh, to talk about it? We've had we've had a bit of a fad on this uh, on this podcast, Glenn, where you're the fourth premiership player we've had on, and each week we seem to be bringing up the grand final parade because we think it's an interesting mm. day as a whole. Tom Boyd had a hilarious story. Alex Johnson did. Um, Tuvi was sitting next to Goldsack. He wasn't even playing. Uh, one. 95, did they do a parade? And two, what was it like? <laughs> what do you think it was, horse and cart or something? God, give me a parade. <laughs> you know what? The thing that always stands out for me about the grand final parade is that ridiculous, inane, stupid and blatantly reflective of personality conversation around certain people. You know, Robert Walls, Dennis Pagan, who used to say, you shouldn't wear sunglasses in the grand final parade. Like, seriously, it's <laughs> fucking hot. It's sunny. Put some sunglasses on. Calm the fuck down. Worry about dealing with your perm and get on with life. Like, seriously, I'm just, that's that's the one memory that stands out for me. This is a, it's such a great thing that you can engage with the community like that. Again, I just never took any of that for granted. That's why the idea of, players and I didn't hear this from a player mind you I just heard from media people saying you know players are going to struggle playing with zero people in a stadium wow no you should be wrapped if one person turns up to watch you even out of these sorts of podcasts slash video uh, casts if you will who cares who how who many people listen to like it just doesn't matter even if it's just one person really loves it or hates it uh, at, at least you engage with somebody I think that's that's the positive thing about these sorts of experiences. I'm sorry. I just, my battery is low on my phone. We saw your little graphic, Glenn. Oh, we had to read. Just what, what came up there? We saw you. We saw your little uh, cartoon graphic. What's that all about? A little cartoon me. Mm, my life's a cartoon, so I might as well have a cartoon head. Um, <laughs> I desperately need a head. My hair's gone back to 1995. Yeah. Uh, no. Got the dead cat on the head. Uh, but, you know, no, grand final parade. Like, how cool is that? I mean, you're going up uh, the streets of Melbourne, the centre of Melbourne, and there's thousands of people, both football supporters, by the team and in general, just public in general, and they're celebrating the fact that you're playing in a game. I just think that these are the things that are to be cherished. And if you want to wear a pair of sunglasses or have your hair pink or whatever, who cares? Just go and enjoy the day. Yeah, I like it. No, it's uh, it's shrewd advice, Glenn. Uh, people do need to lighten up a little bit, don't they? Um, the next one, and we've alluded to it twice already, so it's been a nice little build-up for the uh, resident, passionate Essendon fan, Rob Crawford. But 99, the prelim is simply incredible. It's one of the best finals games I've ever seen. I actually went back this morning and, and watched uh, what was a condensed version of of the major highlights of the last quarter, about eight minutes worth, and it was bloody beautiful. Um, it's an incredible game, as I said. Uh, it goes right down to the wire. Uh, there's an incre- there's an insane moment, really, where Brown tackles, is it Wallace, uh, towards the end, and then Justin Murphy uh, grabs the ball and takes it down the other, fi- other end of the field. I think he kicks it to Brett Ratton, and then he kicks it back to Justin Murphy, and then, of course, the siren goes. Um, it's pure ecstasy given the fact that Essendon really were the leading team of that year in 1999. Carlton had finished sixth, so it was a real fairy tale for Carlton to even make that grand final and, and beat Essendon in the prelim. Um, what was the emotion like? I know it doesn't work out for you the next week when you unfortunately, for your sake, fall to North Melbourne in the decider, but that game just gets referenced time and time and time again. And it's a sore point for Essendon fans, no doubt. Well, Essendon fans shouldn't be disappointed about it because that's a great example of how dogged their team is too. They just happen to lose on the day. It could have easily been us. Uh, and I, I will go there. The winner was football. It really was. It was one of the great games, uh, full stop. Uh, it, it would have to be in the top three greatest games of all time. 
at, that I've ever witnessed. I'm sure there have been some amazing games that I've not been privy to in any way, shape or form. Uh, but from what I've seen, extraordinary. Certainly the greatest game I ever played in. Uh, and to think that both teams played so well, there were so many incredible moments. There's so many subplots. There's so many adjuncts to the story. Oops, I lost you. Come back. <laughs> got rear-ended. I got rear-ended in the traffic here. Take it easy. I can't even get the horn to work. Uh, Brilliant. The, and look, it's it's not a bad thing that the uh, the camera fell down there because that's the genuinely that's the passion and the emotion that it stirs. I mean, I could from selfishly to tell a quick story about myself. So obviously, before that game, I'd made that comment on national television where I dropped the f bomb and I'd said we need to stick it up the f and bombers. Uh, which seems strange now that I'm censoring myself given the rest of this particular conversation. Uh, but I've, I've said that. You mentioned Justin Murphy. Well, obviously, his life has taken many turns since that particular game. So many different characters on the field. I mean, the one emotion that really pops up to me or for me in that particular space of memory around that game is Mark McCurry. I mean, to this day, of all the people on the field that... I would not like to have seen have the ball in that situation for those people who haven't seen the game, probably very few, but Mark McCurry, a wonderfully talented player, very uh, adept with the ball in his hand. I played junior football with him. So I knew him as a person, as a player, I knew how terrific he was. He has a chance to essentially win the game. uh, I won't say from point blank range or with an easy kick, but with a kick that I would have thought nine out of 10 times he makes And when I saw that, I still remember it as clear as day. When I saw the ball in his hand, my heart just dropped. And I thought, oh, no, he'll kick this goal. And for him to miss it, I couldn't believe it. And then for Dean Wallace to take on Fraser Brown, which is, you know, it's probably one of the all-time greatest gaffes in AFL football. Uh, Again, if Dean Wallace... He was, without doubt, a very good long kick. If he had just kicked that ball long into the forward line, who knows what could have happened. I would have said that Dean Wallace could kick 50 metres all day, every day, even at that late point in the game. Put him down for 55 metres. Go and watch the footage and imagine where that ball would have landed 55 metres from where he could have kicked it and think about how that game could have been different. But, you know, Fraser Brown doesn't get enough credit as a person. I think he's just a a really, really interesting, awesome person who uh, always was what you saw is what you got. And the way he played, again, as a player, he gets zero credit for his career. Uh, Certainly not anywhere near what he should get. He was a brilliant player and you just, you wouldn't have taken him on. And he did. And he paid the price. It was brilliant. Yeah, it was... It was bonkers, Glenn. It was absolutely bonkers. It was stark raving bonkers. Yes. No, it was bonkers. And the other thing about that footage, just before we uh, wrap up with a couple, and Rob's got a a quiz for you, which he's very excited about, um, is he's got Dustin Fletcher on his left-hand side as well in space, Wallace, if he wants to use him. You talk about blokes. Can I interrupt you? Yeah. I, I must be honest. I don't think I've ever realized that. If that's true, and I, I'm not really interested in reliving football games, but if that is true, I'm definitely going to go back and watch that footage because that makes it even more ridiculous. Yeah, exactly. So I, when I went back through and watched it, and I, I, this is the thing, I'm saying what you're saying right now. I actually wasn't aware that Dustin Fletcher, the Torpedo King, is next to Wallace, and I'm sure I'm sure Rob could probably verify this, but Fletch is literally just sitting there, standing, waiting for the ball in space because, of course, Wallace goes in board. He doesn't take, he doesn't go the fat side, right? He takes it in board. Um, so it's just a fascinating subplot, as you said. Mercury misses again. I couldn't believe he misses it, and then Fletch has an opportunity to just bin a top from sixty that'll probably go eighty meters, as we know. And it could have been Essendon in, in the grand final instead of Carlton. So, ah, just amazing. Um, Glenn, favourite players. Um, you talked about Carlton being a famous team. We'll just keep it on the Carlton theme, given the fact that you spent majority of your career there. But Diesel Williams, incredible player, kicked five in the 95 grand final and had 31 touches. Uh, Cooter, of course, Silvani. Um, the list really goes on. Craig Bradley, one of my favourites growing up as a kid, unbelievable accumulator. 
Who, who were the ones that stood out for you? Who, who were the ones when you're at training, you just thought, oh, these blokes ooze quality? The vast majority of them. I mean, the, the guy, I, don't, I just never been into sports in a way of trying to, to, I guess, equate or evaluate the talent based on uh, well, you know, what you saw them do on the day, what you saw a player do on the day. Again, going back into this particular conversation might have been a particular role. You know, Craig Bradley, I have zero doubt that Craig Bradley could have averaged 40 touches a game every game. Zero doubt whatsoever. You know, Greg Williams in a forward pocket role each week, he may have kicked three or four goals every week. You know, you just don't know. So everyone's playing a role. I don't really judge them like that. When I think about a Greg Williams, I think about how, to me, he was probably operating at maybe 9.25 out of 10 every game in terms of his in terms of his competitiveness. And I think that's extraordinary. Craig Bradley, in terms of his overall person and his uh, ability to be a father and a role model, and even now to be fit and healthy, you know, here's a guy who's operating at 12 out of 10 on that scale. Uh, Kuda, Kuda's Kuda. Uh, he's still doing 4,000 sit-ups a day, which is amazing. Uh, but even just being able to, again, bring that whole ping up the ball in one hand. I, I just don't even... I don't even look at that as being anything special. I just see that as being Kuda. And I think that makes it even nicer that he had that ability to bring something to the game that was just so unique. Uh, but he just it was just a flamboyance that was almost unintentional. You know, again, the Silvanis, the Deans, we could go on for hours. I mean, Brad Pierce. I mean, here's Brad Pierce, who again and doesn't get enough credit. Super fast. I, I don't know what his accuracy rate would have been, but my goodness, there was three or four years there where he just seemed to be kicking four or five goals a game and critical goals, really good goals. Scott Camparelli, uh, if, if he had a, if he had a, sorry. Yeah, well, if he had somehow found a way just to curb his temper just a little bit uh, towards the umpires, he probably could have won a Brownlow medal. I mean, he, he was that good a player. And again, somebody who just didn't really get cheap possessions and used the ball so well. Uh, there are just so many guys, both at Essendon and Carlton and, and throughout the league. Uh, I just it, it always frustrates me when I hear people in this modern age where everyone's got a, a voice and supposedly their voice is so important, put people down in any sport, in any walk of life, saying, you know, they weren't very good. So, poor decision making in general but those guys that really are champions of the game and that extends all sports and of course both sexes they're people who are just talented and work day in and day out and and really give everything they have to be being the best they can and as tried as that is I think a lot of those Carlton players put in a lot of time and effort in that space to try and just to be the best they can do. Certainly do. Uh, last one before we get on to or the, the quiz. quiz. Glenn, last one. Can't wait. Uh, you said you said you're not that big on the the off you know, the on field stats and things like that, but somewhere I know you do apply yourself is the off field. Nine ninety five, mm-hmm. Mad Monday, would have been pretty <laughs> raucous. Who was uh who was usually the best off field performer? Wow, now that is a good question. Well, there is some really disappointing footage via Channel Ten that is on YouTube of myself uh, performing very badly at Mad Monday. Uh, look, honestly, and the kids bring it up all the time. They pull that up and show me and say, Dad, that's not how you drink Sam Booker. Uh, look, <laughs> you, you would certainly say Fraser Brown is, is right up there in that particular space. Stephen Kernahan, again, you know, if you, if you really want to bring it back to beers consumed and behaviour, he, he was a guy who could probably drink 15, 20 litres of alcohol and not change at all, just be exactly the same person which is pretty exceptional stuff. I, don't, I have no idea where the alcohol went. Uh, but in all seriousness, there was a, a really interesting group of guys who uh, played football and, and partied and uh, enjoyed life and, and, of course, now raised families in their own unique way. Uh, each of them has great skill sets, great abilities. I could I heap praise on, on my teammates for hours and hours on end because there are some ex- exceptional people there. And, you know, again, to step backwards, just to highlight a Craig Bradley, uh, Craig Bradley's AFL career means very, very little to me, really. Uh, it's, it's inconsequential. People have good careers, poor careers, like whatever. But he is a role model. He being Craig Bradley is a role model. 
uh, and, and the way he presents himself physically, mentally, emotionally, his ability to care, you know, raise his family, invest in his children, uh, these sorts of things are outstanding and they're the things that I like to engage with and I like to enjoy and, and, and learn from on a daily basis. I think there's you know, people such as Craig, uh, in, in all walks of life and they're the ones that need to be highlighted because I really can't stress it enough to get 20 possessions a game in the, in the game of AFL football probably isn't that hard when you're just given the freedom to do so. All right, time for the quiz. Uh, this is our third edition of the quarantine quiz. Now, Glenn, there are uh, generally gen- general knowledge questions, a couple of footy questions thrown in there, but it's nice and broad for you, but we'll start yep. with a football one. Who I'm winding down the window. Okay. Who, who won the 1995 Brownlow medal? 1995 Brownlow medal. Uh, that would have been Alex Ishenko. No, it was Paul Kelly. Glenn! Uh, question two. Was Alex Ishenko in the top ten? Uh, let's have a look. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> top 20? Uh, 30, 40, 50. It was a joke. Please move on. Uh, Question two Can you name two of the three countries Known as the Baltic states The Baltic states Well does Croatia fit into that space Is that correct You're a wrong part of Europe there Oh where am I Well is that back to the Ukraine No Oh I've lost my battery again I'm coming back Saved by the battery Tell me fill me in the Baltic states Baltic states, uh, I'm looking for Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. The ones I was looking for. Glenn, come Question on. Question three. I'm stuck in traffic. Sorry. <laughs> Question three. Uh, who was the first person to climb Mount Everest? Oh, Hillary. Correct. That's one point. Well done. Uh, Question four. What year did Port Adelaide join the AFL? 19... 19- I'm going to say 1997. You. That is correct. Well done. And I meant uh, Hillary Clinton too. Hillary Clinton, yeah. <laughs> uh, question five. Baltic Sally States. Pearson competes for Australia in which athletics event? She would be in the hurdles. Correct. Ooh. Nice uh, the, the Solius Muscles. I'll spell it because I might have said it wrong. S O L E U S. E U S. Muscles are located in which part of the body? They're in the left testicle. They stretch up from the left testicle into the base of the penis. <laughs> you should rub them and keep them loose every day. Are you being uh, serious? That is, that is incorrect. It, it is. It is the it's calf. In the calf. Of course, it's, it's in, in the, the calf. calf. <laughs> We're not giving you a point. Uh, it, Oh, I'm getting a I'm getting a point for that because no, I no, you didn't take it, it seriously enough. You're not getting. Oh, a point. come on! I knew where the solius was. Oh, my God. Okay. Uh, question seven: Who was the last Victorian? Oh, you're so, oh sorry. I thought scrotum. Sorry, Scro- scrotum. No, I got totally wrong. My apologies. <laughs> don't shave. Don't shave your scully. <laughs> no, it's <your> solius. <laughs> anyway, question question seven: Who was the last Victorian Labor Premier before Daniel Andrews? Oh, I'm. I'm uh, I'll, I'll go back to. Was it Joan Kerner? No, it Kane. was John. It John, was John Brumby. Oh, Brumby! Oh, so forgettable. Yeah, yeah he was. <laughs> question. Question eight. Oh, Who it. is the Carlton Games record holder most games played? Well, that. May in fact be Craig Bradley. It is. It is indeed. You are correct. Question yep. nine: What is the largest lake in Australia? Something's telling me to say Lake Eyre, but I don't know if that's true or not. I should probably know. I'll say Lake Eyre. Lake Eyre is correct. Whoa! Another point. Question ten. Hang on. How many has he got? He's on six, so he's currently out no, uh, top, seven. top of the leader. No, see, I included that one. I included Solius. You're on six. Thank you. Um, you're currently on top of the leaderboard. Question 10. This is mm. a good one. Mm. According to the website AFL Tables, this is a stats footy website, how yeah. many Brownlow votes did you get in your AFL career? Well, goodness me. <laughs> how many did I get or how many should I have gotten? 
How many did you get? I should have gotten around 60. Um, <laughs> how many did I get? AFL tables. Yeah. Four legs. Yeah. I'm going to say my entire career, let's say nine. Oh, you're close. It was seven. seven. So well done. Bunch Very well fucks. done, Glenn. Six out of ten. You are our top performer of the quarantine quiz so far. So well done. Well, I am disappointed about that Baltic question. That was very poor on my behalf. Didn't really think that through. Caught me off guard with it. actually a decent question. Thank you, Rob. That's okay. That's okay. Well, thank you for playing. Uh, I'm, there might be a prize. Maybe not, but we'll see how we go. There, there probably won't be a prize. I think it's just all for pride. But I, I don't know. But Glenn, I wouldn't be too upset. Alex Johnson only got two and, and you ended up getting six. Uh, Alan Tooby yeah. got five. So you've just surpassed him so if it's a top gear top, top gear, gear i'm not proud i'm great. not proud of my efforts at all well that's it that you're a six out of ten mate question of you what adrian, yep, go for adrian. <laughs> yeah so sorry rob can i just ask adrian is your house modeled on some sort of medieval theme i'm wondering what that chair is behind you it's been bothering me during the whole segment which which chair my chair you've got a chair over your right shoulder Looks yeah, a bit well, medieval, well, a little bit like some sort of contraption used for, you know, I don't know, torture. Uh, no, no, that, <laughs> that's that that chair, that chair as well, because we're doing this on Zoom, and I've actually got a camcorder just off shot here, right? Which is what the which is what the viewers will say. Rob, we might have to take a photo of this particular chair and then just stitch it into the edit. But this, yeah, I will. Yeah, but this, I'll, I'll, can, I'll, I'll put a screenshot in. I'll, I'll tell you the story. That chair was uh, was done by my granddad. He um, he basically just redoes chairs up for a, for a living. Um, in his, in his <laughs> of course chair. he does. What a life. Um, and he loves it. So people just bring in their old broken furniture. Um, and he just he uh he just does them up and 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 puts them back to uh their former condition and um, that's why I have that chair and he gave that chair to my wife so it's just a nice little sentimental gesture nothing medieval whatsoever very nice so, I like it well gentlemen that's been an absolute pleasure for me that's that's made my whole quarantine day feel like a, an absolute breeze I've just pushed on through and now I'm ready to get back to my normal life which will see me take my beautiful little dog down to the local park in Newport so if you're out there watching listening however you happen to be digesting this and you happen to be able to be uh, i guess anywhere in the western suburbs of melbourne come down to the local park here in newport and see me walking my dog jacks <laughs> say hello at 1.5 meters of course beautiful you will get the total sum of zero people coming down to meet you but that's okay <laughs> well we'll find out won't we we'll see what happens when yeah. this goes to air we'll see if, if someone approaches you no, you are. you are. And I like it. And we need to communicate more. And that's the beautiful thing about this. I've been calling friends and family more than I ever have before. And it's been it's been wonderful. Good. I could. I, we could do that. Well, why do, is it non-essential travel if I jump in the car and go down to Newport? If, if you're traveling to participate in exercise, I can't see any issue with that. Okay. okay. As long right. as you don't display an L plate, because then you'll get a $1,600 fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Well, Glenn, it's been an absolute pleasure. Rob and I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, very eloquent, very articulate as always, and uh, refreshing to hear some of your opinions about pe people or footballers rather being people first and the great qualities that they have rather than what they did on the field. I think there's some really good messaging in that for everyone listening and watching. So thank you very much. Thanks, it's been, a, been a pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you.